Hello friends, this is the Neatarts Friends Church Podcast. We are Jesus people, Kingdom of God people, welcoming, yearning, sharing. And we're glad you're connecting here with us. We'd love to connect in person as well. If you're inclined to support this podcast or for more information, just hop on over to neatartsfriends.org. That's neatartsfriends.org. Let's jump into today's sermon. Have you ever been standing in a line at the cafe, the coffee shop, or the DMV, and someone just blatantly cuts in front of you and acts like you aren't even there? Or maybe you've had your name on the wait list to be seated at a restaurant for 20 minutes, and just as the table is opening up, Someone who just arrived walks right past you and everyone else waiting for a table and they just plop down at that table, oblivious to the fact that there are people all around waiting for a table. Or you're in traffic and traffic is at a crawl, it's rush hour, and most people are patiently waiting their turn to merge onto the next highway. But there's always that person who They take the open lane next to you. They go all the way to the front of the line. And then at the last possible second, they try to duck in and get the exit. In those kinds of situations, what do you think? What do you say out loud? So on Sunday, we shared this as a quick discussion question. Um, just your first unfiltered response. What is the first thing that goes through your mind? Not what you wish you said or think you should say, but just what, what pops out of you. So take a moment and recognize that. Okay, did you think or say any of the following? Um, Was there any name calling involved, (laughs) Uh, moderate to spicy? Did you say or think something like, um, hello, don't you see us all sitting here? Like, we're all waiting our turn. Or maybe you said, why do they think they can do that? What makes them so special? Who do they think they are anyways? Well, what we're talking about here is an attitude of entitlement. Entitlement has been defined in this way. I I like this definition. An inflated and pervasive sense of deservingness, self-importance, and exaggerated expectations to receive special goods and treatment without reciprocating. When we witness attitudes of entitlement in others, it really tends to put a bad taste in our mouth. We don't like it when other people act entitled, when they act like, I'm special, I'm better, I'm a cut above others, I deserve this, I deserve special treatment, I can do whatever I want. A friend of mine who just finished coaching a football season was recently telling me about seniors who leave football gear out on the field after practice and tell underclassmen, to go clean up all the gear and haul it in. They act like they are above such a menial task, so they make their inferiors do the job. It's been said, if you want to know what a person is like, take a good look at how they treat their inferiors, not their equals. People with an attitude of entitlement act like they deserve special treatment, like the rules don't apply to them that other people are below them and they're superior. And so they push their weight around, whether it's their wealth or their power, their strength. They expect other people to do what they say and they demand things their way. They act like the world somehow owes them something. They act like they shouldn't have to work as hard as other people, that some tasks are just below them and they deserve certain opportunities. They might treat wait staff and customer service people poorly. 
They refuse to take no for an answer. Their wants and needs come before everyone else's. They think it's okay to ask people for favors, even big stuff. But if you're asking them for a little tiny something, little favor, uh, it's a big deal to them. They're like, what is the problem that you would ask me to do that? They tend to be lacking in empathy. They often want the limelight. They often enjoy the attention. They take whatever they want without asking. It's an attitude of entitlement. Now, the description that I just gave you of an entitled person puts a really bad taste in my mouth. But then I think back to an experience that happened in my 20s where I was venting to a friend and my friend pulled me up short and said, um, Aaron, you're sounding really entitled right now. And I remember I was very taken aback. Uh, I really struggled to see what my friend meant. Was it because my friend was wrong? Or was it because actually we all struggle to see our own attitudes of entitlement? There was a sobering study that was done in partnership by researchers from the University of Virginia, University of Toronto, Stanford, Emory University, and it found that we tend to be blind to the attitudes of entitlement that we're born into. We don't even try to hide our born into attitudes of entitlement because we don't see those attitudes necessarily as a problem. And so we tend to almost take pride in those attitudes. So here's how the study went. Participants in the study were asked a number of questions about their background, like income, education, social status, class, upbringing, parents' income, education, family wealth, etc. And then the participants were asked a number of questions where they rate themselves. And that part of the study, the, the questions related to attitudes of entitlement. Now, they didn't tell them that's what the questions were about. But they were asking questions that showed people's self-importance and what they think they deserve, this kind of stuff. Now, it was no surprise to the researchers that people coming from a higher class and more wealth and more education tended to also have higher levels of entitlement. That was not really surprising. But what was surprising was the difference between people who were born into a higher class, more wealth, more education, and people who were the first generation and in the same situation now they were in a higher class, now they had the same amount of wealth, now they had the same amount of education. The difference between those two groups, the born into group and the first generation group, the born into people, the higher class, wealthier, more educated families, they reported 33% higher levels of entitlement than the first generation crew. So they found that the born into group didn't even try to hide the way that they think about themselves. They were blatant in the way that they basically said in their answers, look, I'm a star. I deserve more. I'm better. And so the researchers commented, they said, it's fascinating how deeply entrenched these feelings of entitlement actually are. The researchers noted how much we are conditioned by our early life experiences in such a way that we think it's normal and acceptable to have access to certain resources and social networks and opportunities and certain treatment, and it's the born into factor. Now, none of us want to claim that we're entitled, but what if we aren't very good at recognizing when we're acting entitled? And so the study begs a painful question. What is it that I expect and take for granted in life that other people don't expect, they can't expect? 
in what ways do I think that I'm special and better than others simply because of the social location that I was born into? So a quick discussion or reflection question. Take a moment to explore the social location you were born into. What are things that other people took for granted but you didn't have the same resources, you didn't have the same access, you didn't have the same opportunities. And what are things that you took for granted that other people couldn't take for granted? Take a moment and reflect on that. All right, this brings us to our scripture today. It's the story of John the Baptist who was preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And I'll remind you that repentance means to rethink, to think again, to think along with someone, which begs the question, okay, what is it that John the Baptist, as the forerunner to Jesus, wanted people to re rethink? Repentance always has this, like this whole life transformation in view. It's not just I'm thinking, but it's this is going to change me. And so John's job was to help people get ready to receive the good stuff that was coming from God. The, he's the forerunner to Jesus. And so he's helping people open their hearts to new possibilities from God. And I want to suggest to you that part of the sin, you know, this forgiveness of sins, the release from sin, part of the spiritual illness that John the Baptist was putting his finger on in his day was this spirit of entitlement that he saw within his culture. John was saying, and I hear him saying this today, like no matter how religious you tell yourself you are, no matter who you can claim as your ancestors or what tribe you belong to, entitlement is always paganism. It causes us to close ourselves off from God. And in order for any of us to be ready to receive the good stuff that God wants to give us, we need cleansed from this spirit. We need released from this spirit of entitlement so that we can experience this transformation of heart and life that touches the most mundane and the most systemic aspects of, of life. So pay attention as we read this scripture. See if you can spot the thread of entitlement running through this passage through the people and the culture that John is speaking to. Here it is. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea and Herod was tetrarch of Galilee and his brother Philip was tetrarch of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis and Lysanias was tetrarch of Abilene during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the region around the Jordan River, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one shouting in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley will be filled, and every mountain and hill will be brought low, and the crooked will be made straight, and the rough ways will be made smooth, and all humanity will see the salvation of God. All flesh will see the salvation of God. So John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You offspring of vipers, you children of snakes, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Therefore, produce fruit that proves your repentance. And don't begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. 
For I tell you that God can raise up children for Abraham from these stones. Even now the axe is laid at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. So the crowds were asking him, What then should we do? And John answered them, The person who has two tunics must share with the person who has none, and the person who has food must do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized, and they said to him, Teacher, what should we do? And he told them, Collect no more than you're required to. And then some soldiers also asked him, And as for us, what should we do? He told them, Take money from no one by violence or by false accusation, and be content with your pay. Now, perhaps you can already see the thread of entitlement running through that, but I want to offer you just a few historic and cultural tidbits that will help the entire picture snap into focus even more. So first, let's talk about baptism in John the Baptist day. Baptism in John's day was reserved for non-Jewish people. It was reserved for Gentiles, for foreigners who wanted to convert to Judaism. Jewish people did not receive baptism in John's day because baptism was an act of washing away all of that pagan, foreigner, unclean ickiness. So to tell a Jewish person that they needed to be baptized was an insult. It was an affront to their heritage and their lineage. It was like saying, you're no better than an unclean Gentile. Now for an imperfect modern day comparison, uh, making the journey out into the wilderness to receive baptism for repentance might be compared to telling a bunch of U.S. citizens in Tillamook County that they should all make the journey down to the U.S. border in Tijuana, Mexico. And then once they're in Mexico, they all dump their papers behind, no driver's license, social security, passport. They treat all of their born-into factors as if they're irrelevant. And they just show up at the border, the U.S. border, saying to the border agents, look, we want to begin the process of becoming U.S. citizens. And the border agents say, well, do you have any of your papers? And they say, no, we don't have any of our papers. We just want to start the process. Now, that's not a perfect comparison, but it captures some of the essence of how this would strike a Jewish audience. You might say to someone like this, you're crazy. You you don't need to do that. You're already a U.S. citizen. You were born here. You already have all of your papers. Why would you subject yourself to something like this? And that's the same kind of question as why would crowds of Jewish people go get baptized in the wilderness? Now let's add another detail. Beliefs about ancestors. So the Jewish people in the first century believed that they were chosen by God, that they were saved by virtue of being ancestors of Abraham. If you were an ethnic Jew, you were already in. And so they were proud of their attitude of entitlement that they had been born into. They had been waiting for, it's what they called the day of the Lord, for hundreds of years. They had been waiting for God to bring judgment on all of their foreign enemies, waiting for God to give them back the land. And so this is the kind of Messiah they were anticipating and waiting for. And somehow the people of Israel had completely missed the plot. They had lost themselves in an attitude of entitlement because they believed they were chosen for the sake of being chosen. They were blessed for the sake of being blessed. And they had forgotten that actually they were chosen and called and elected and blessed in order that all the people on earth might be blessed through them. And for the purpose of being a light to the nations. Those are like some of the key scriptures of Israel's 
God choosing Israel is like Genesis 12 verse 3 and Isaiah 49 6 that uh, show, oh yeah, you're not chosen just for your own sake. Theologian Mark Baker says it this way. He says, election or being chosen by God is not so much the special status of a privileged few, but the mandate of those God recruits to bring about the restoration of all the rest. Uh, N.T. Wright says, the point is that we aren't chosen for our own sake, but for the sake of what God wants to accomplish through us. So John anticipated that people in his audience, people who were coming out to see what's going on out in the wilderness with this baptism thing, they would hear about this baptism of repentance and their counter argument would be, uh, we have Abraham as our father. John anticipated that. And so instead of calling them children of Abraham, John called them children of snakes. And rather than acting like they were the special privileged few because of their ethnic lineage and heritage, he told them, look, God can make children of Abraham out of rocks in the desert. I, I don't know about you, but I don't like someone talking about replacing me at all, even if, I've, even if I'm being replaced by someone really incredible. But John told these people, who were trying to play the we're the ancestors of Abraham card, he said, God can replace you with rocks. Uh, yeah, John's speaking in pretty radical ways. I mean, if this doesn't wake you up, I don't know what will. And he, he certainly woke some people up. Luke describes John the Baptist's work in this way. He says, uh, Every, this is, uh, he's quoting Isaiah. He says, every valley will be filled. Every mountain and hill will be brought low. The crooked will be made straight. The rough ways will be made smooth. And all flesh, all humanity will see the salvation of God. When you zoom out, notice how every valley, every mountain, every hill is is brought low. The crooked is made straight. The rough ways look smooth. And you see things differently. Brian Zahn says, salvation is for the restoration of all creation to God's original goodness. That word all is really important in that scripture. Leading New Testament scholar and uh, theologian, Baptist guy that comes from McAfee School of Theology, he says this about that, that all flesh, that all humanity that Isaiah uses. He says it always includes precisely those groups who are not present in our religious assemblies, either because we've not allowed them to be there or because we've maintained cultural patterns that excluded them. And Luke specifically names the groups that John the Baptist was including in his baptism people who would have been excluded from Jewish worship settings. He tells us John the Baptist was out in the wilderness baptizing these people and making disciples, followers of these people. These were the most despised Jews, tax collectors. Even the most despised Gentiles, Roman soldiers, were being included in the conversation. He was baptizing, we're told, the whole Judean countryside, all of Jerusalem, the entire region of the Jordan. People were coming from all of these areas. It truly was all humanity out there in the wilderness being invited to repent, to rethink, welcomed into a new life of faith in God. And Luke later tells us that the Pharisees, the experts in the law, were the only ones who refused to repent, to rethink. He says, all the people, even the tax collectors, when they heard Jesus' words, acknowledged that God's way was right because they had been baptized by John. But the Pharisees and the experts in the law rejected God's purpose for themselves because they had not been baptized by John. So repentance, rethinking, inevitably leads people to ask, well, what should we do? 
And so John began giving people these suggestions that ran in the opposite direction of a spirit of entitlement. This is towards a transformation of heart. It's towards a completely new lifestyle. A spirit of entitlement says, my wants and needs come before everyone else's wants and needs. And John said to the crowds, anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none. And anyone who has food should do the same. So can you see how John was reversing patterns of entitled thinking and living? Can you hear John saying that the way you become ready to receive the kingdom of God is to rethink your relationship with your shirts in your closet and the food in your cupboard and the material and financial resources in your life? Rethink your relationship with your less fortunate neighbors and your community. Rethink even your relationship with yourself. John was speaking to a society of limited goods where hoarding and accumulating things was it was always considered actions of greed and evil because the pie there were only so many slices of pie and if you took more than your share someone else wasn't getting pie that's the image it so it was a world where a lot of people only had one shirt a lot of people wondered every day, will I have bread to eat today? And so John was making an extremely practical suggestion that still could offer real help to you and to me. He was inviting people to practice perspective taking, which is, what does it look like to look through the eyes of someone else, especially someone less fortunate? But what does it look like to look through the eyes of the migrant worker, the asylum seeker, the domestic violence victim, the drug addict trying to find their way out, the depressed person, the single mother, the lonely elderly person, the foster child. What does it look like to even look through the eyes of your spouse, your kids? He was inviting people to learn the difference between their wants and their needs when it came to their money, their stuff, their home life. And he was inviting them as they learned that difference to find real ways to put the needs of less fortunate people before their own wants, to practice giving and helping those people without expecting anything in return. Now, we all live in an advertisement culture that is constantly telling us your life could be good if you had this or you had that or you had the other and we get these little short-term dopamine hits when we anticipate buying something new and then experience the reward of actually buying it acquiring it it gives us a little chemical high a little dopamine hit getting new stuff feels good for a moment but interestingly the chemical cocktail of that short-term dopamine hit is actually nothing in comparison to the cocktail of oxytocin, dopamine, and endorphins that you get from generosity and service. That cocktail, it, it's been called the giver's glow, and research actually shows that generosity can increase your longevity. It actually truly lasts. And this is what John is inviting people towards. Can you see how John is hes trying to open people's hearts to a new possibility that God wants to give them? Now, the despised tax collectors, they wanted to know, well, what should we do? In the first century, the chief tax collector was the only person who knew how much money the Roman Empire was demanding of the people. Uh, but the chief tax collector could demand any amount of money he wanted. So talk about extortion and corruption. But it's important to note the difference between chief tax collectors and tax collectors. Tax collectors were simply employees of the chief tax collector. They weren't the ones who tended to benefit the most from all of that cheating and extortion. They didn't even know necessarily how much money was being made. 
they tended to be people whose society had rejected in one way or another and often were unable to find a different way to earn an income. And so John says to these people, these tax collectors collect no more than you are required to. Now notice he doesn't say, you all should quit your jobs. Some of them probably couldn't find another job. He doesn't say quit your job, but he steers them away from entitlement. The entire Roman tax system was built on the assumption of greed and dishonesty, and John was pointing these people towards integrity and honesty. Entitlement says the rules don't apply to me. I can bend the rules however I want. I can demand whatever I want. I can act like the world owes me, and I don't have to take no for an answer. Now, obviously, we aren't tax collectors, but John's suggestion, collect no more than you're required, it begs some real questions of us, which would be, what are the systems that are built on assumptions of greed and dishonesty and the expectation of everyone is like, well, you're just going to go along with this and you'll, you'll be a part of it. Psychologists talk about a cognitive distortion called moral licensing, where you internally justify things that you do that are dishonest and wrong. Like you say, ah, it's okay if I fudge the numbers here. It's okay if I tell a lie here. It's okay if I ignore the traffic signal here. And you justify it internally. This brings up a million situations in life where a spirit of entitlement tempts us to act like we don't have to play by the rules. Like we say, yeah, the rules are intended for the common good, but they're inconvenient to me. and It's not going to mess anyone up if I do this. I hear John inviting me, inviting you to face this kind of a question. Am I choosing to find an alternative path where at the end of the day I can say, I lived with integrity and honesty today and I didn't need, I don't need to internally justify anything to myself. I'm not doing that move of moral licensing and I can just end the day saying, I, I lived with integrity. I lived with honesty. What happens to your heart when you live that way versus what happens when you're ending your day with this internal justification? How can you be open to receive the good stuff that God wants to give you if internally you're, you're you have this cognitive distortion, this moral licensing where you're internally justifying things. And so John is trying to clear that up. There were soldiers who came to John and they also asked the same question, like, okay, what should we do? A, a soldier's allowance at the time was small and writings from the time, historical writings, recount that soldiers... They threatened violence, they falsely accused people, they intimidated people, they extorted money from local people. Some scholars have even said this was kind of the expectation. Like entitlement had found its way not only into homes, but into human structures and into systems of injustice. Entitlement says, you know what, it's fine to throw my weight around. It's fine to use my power to manipulate situations to my advantage. I can take what I want without asking. It's no big deal. And John the Baptist said to the soldiers, do no violence to anyone, nor accuse any falsely. Be content with your wages. Now, sure, you may not be a Roman soldier, but when you are consumed with what you don't have, it lends itself to misusing the power that you do have in relationships, treating people in hurtful ways to get what you want. It's been said the polar opposite of entitlement is gratitude, it's contentment. Notice that it's really hard to sim simultaneously be full of gratitude and be really mean. 
to be a jerk. It's like they cancel one another out. It's really hard to do them both at the same time. Being thankful for the life that you have right here, right now, keeps entitlement from finding a place to root itself and set up shop in your heart. In fact, researchers have found that one of the primary antidotes to entitlement is practicing gratitude for every good thing in your life, no matter how small it really doesn't matter how insignificant, just practice gratitude. And John, I see John telling these Roman soldiers this same thing 2,000 years ago. This is a practice that opens you up so that you can receive the good stuff that God wants to give to you. So I want to close today with the most important question which is not, okay, what did people 2,000 years ago uh, need to do? Like, they're asking this question, what should we do? The most important question is, what should we do today, 2023, or whenever you're listening to this? And so a final reflection question A final discussion question if you're listening along with someone else. What is the action? What is the practice? What is the suggestion, the reframe in thinking that the Spirit is causing to ping in your mind? The thing that you can't escape. This way of staying open to God and keeping the spirit of entitlement from finding a place to root in your heart. So take a moment and listen to the Holy Spirit. What is that? And what would it look like for you to take real steps today and this week to make this a regular part of your life, to have a transformed heart and a transformed Thank you for joining us for a Sunday sermon from Neatart's Friends Church. We hope you'll join us soon for one of our in-person worship gatherings. For more information, hop on over to neatartsfriends.org. God's peace be with you, friends.